Welcome back to Talking Europe. You find us in the floral Netherlands. Now this is a country where more than a quarter of the land actually lies below sea level. It's also the EU's most densely populated member state. How then, I hear you ask, does this country, which is rather cramped, end up also being the world's number two exporter of food? Well, in this programme, we're going to be visiting traditional farms, meeting scientists, even computer hackers, to find out a few secrets. First stop, though, a rather high-tech laboratory. This is World Horti Centre. Here we educate people for a job in the whole area of horticulture and technology. On the other side of the building we have a, a greenhouse department where we do applied research. And in the middle building that's a year-round exposition room and demonstration room where companies have their innovations on display. Well, I'm joined here not just by all of these beautiful plants and flowers, but also by a professor of horticulture, Olaf van Kouten. Thanks for being with us. Nice to meet you. Well, the Netherlands is known as being particularly innovative. Can you tell us why that is? One of the problems is not much light and cold. Mm -hmm. And so we, we worked very hard to overcome that. And we made from the disadvantage, we made an advantage. You've mentioned that there's not very much space here in the Netherlands. That's right. How can the Netherlands meet that particular challenge? Well, actually by uh, creating their own climate in greenhouses and then uh, making the efficiency of growth extremely much larger. So we're, we are at this point the largest exporter worldwide of tomatoes. And uh, we do that in actually a very small area. And that means so we have per surface area an extraordinarily large amount of production. Okay, well, let's go and take a look at some of those uh, high-tech greenhouses. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, here we are in the greenhouses with some really rather beautiful cucumber plants. In terms of innovations in the Netherlands, I know that you're very interested in the Netherlands saving the world from a food shortage. Can That's right. it rise up to the challenge? we see that climate change is going, turning lots of areas in the world impossible for food production. What we do here is we uh, encase the food production in glass mm -hmm. and so we, we are free from the climate. And these cucumbers are not growing in soil? No, they grow in, uh, in substrate called rock wool. Like fiberglass? Uh, yeah, yeah, fiberglass but then made, made of, of rock. Uh -huh. yeah. This way we can prevent any diseases in, in, the, in the roots and we can control the growth uh, incredibly securely. A really big question is about the environment. Uh, there is a priority in the European funding to uh, support green agriculture. Absolutely. Here in the Netherlands, farming is intensive. Isn't that a clash with the environmental side? Not really. Actually, uh, going back to small farms is uh, going back in sustainability. The, the point is that we can produce in these uh, compartments with computers and everything, we can produce very high production with low source using and without any pollution to the environment. Now, this is, of course, an extremely high-tech facility in one of the world's wealthiest countries. Can what you're doing here, can it really be exported all around the world? Well, it is being exported, yes. Uh, for example, Mexico, Canada, South America, and also now in India and in Asia and in Africa. People are using it. It is very capital intensive, that's true, but it is a secure way of producing high quality, uh, intensive production. Well, thank you so much for showing us around, for sharing your insights, Professor Olaf van Kouten. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, from the physical innovations here to some more virtual ones now, Anaïs Guerra has been finding out about how hackers are increasingly being called on down on the farm. If you have a, a lot of data, crunch open data. I sleep and breathe with data. Driverless tractors, drones, satellites. High-tech has become routine for this Dutch potato farmer. 
For the past two years, Jacob van den Borne has opened up his farm to a team of designers and developers, a project dubbed Farm Hack. So this is the camera that was developed uh, in a hackathon. So uh, the idea is that it ha uh, that's, uh, it's a fixed camera that's uh, automatically taking pictures on a, di on a GPS location. Jacob's office is now digitally linked to his fields. In winter, he spends three days a week here, analyzing the data. After spending so much time with the farm hackers, he's even become a bit of a geek himself. You are amazed what kind of data there is that we could use as a farmer and that we don't know it, that it's there. On this web application, we can look uh, for, uh, for satellite imagery that's been released or is for free uh, by the European Union. They launched a lot of Sentinel satellites and they are really good satellites for measuring biomass uh, of all the fields. The technology lets farmers keep an eye on their fields at a distance. Jacob is testing the latest innovation, a virtual reality version of his farm. You can really go to the edge of the parcel but not beyond, because then it becomes red, so... Um, um, and now so I'm it, on a it, completely yeah. different spot. Yeah, hey. so... What... <laughs> <laughs> it rains. show you the position. These virtual reality experts are assembling a 3D copy of Jacob's farm. They hope the convergence of technology and terrain will prove valuable to both sides. We are in a technology bubble. Everything is technology and IT, and uh, to go to somewhere, uh, a real farmer with a real challenge and a real problem on his uh, location is, is very interesting to see, to come with solutions for the real world. Wageningen University has become a hub for Dutch agricultural innovation. These farmers and developers are holding another farm hack on the campus. Today's objective, exploiting data collected from thousands of hectares of Dutch farmland. Scientists and farmers, though, don't always speak the same language. How to extract data from the cube? <laughs> yeah, that he made some kind of script. So that's yeah, really only for, uh, yeah, for, 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 for IT guys. Yeah, <laughs> it's not really user-friendly in that uh, way. Behind the jargon, <laughs> this team is trying to get a better understanding of soil structure. But for Yuri Ann, the aim isn't just about building a new gadget. My experience is that usually you do not end up with, a, the, with a, a product which is ready, but you do end up with a lot of experience on, on the data. It is definitely innovation, and what you see is uh, we are farming already for thousands of years, so it would be, yeah, maybe it would be too easy to, to think that in two days or three days' time you would find something completely new. For its organizers, the farm hack's goal is to push for a grassroots movement in agricultural tech. It's not going to be the industry that's going to ask that, that particular question. They are interested in your data, and they are interested in digital strategies, but they are thinking about their shareholders and about their position in the market. They're not thinking about the individual farmer, per se. Farming community really needs to um, take control over. The Farm Hack project has proved a fertile ground for these budding ideas. Not all will bloom into full-fledged products, but they show the way for the future of innovation-hungry farmers. Well, as I mentioned, this is a country that has a shortage of space. That's why we've come here to Urban Farmers in The Hague. It is Europe's largest commercial rooftop farm. I'm with uh, Sophie, who's going to explain Hi. the concept for us. Yes, uh, in our greenhouse we have vegetables and downstairs we have a floor with fish. And what do the fish do? The fish poop in the water. We have bacteria in it who we'll make the ammonia from the poop into nitrate. And we use that uh, for our system for plants because it's a water-based uh, system, so all the nutrients for the plants are in the water instead of soil, so we have no soil. And all of this produce is sold in and around The Hague? Yes, indeed. Okay, that's great. Well, thank you so much, yes, Sophie. We'll leave you. you to your work. Yes, thank you. <laughs> We're going to move on and meet uh, an MEP from the Netherlands, Gerben Jan Gebrandi. Thank you very much for being Hi, with us at Urban Farmers. Hi. Uh, do you believe that uh, farming more responsibly, that means things like this, farming inside towns? It's certainly a, a, a model for now here in, in The Hague in the Netherlands. I very much like it as well because it, it brings people again in contact with producing food because a lot of city people, they don't know how food is being produced anymore. Okay, well, let's uh, move on. We'll go into the next part of the greenhouses. Wonderful. Here we go, moving into the area with the, the tomatoes, the aubergines, peppers, all sorts of things. Uh, if we talk about how farming's funded, I know that you've said in the past that the uh, European CAP funding uh, has failed farmers, nobody's happy, it needs radical reform. Could you expand on that a little? 
Oh, absolutely, yes. We, we spend billions and billions of public money, um, but in a system that is not benefiting the farmers because they, they don't get enough money for the products that they produce. It's the traders, the supermarkets who get the real money. So how can that be fixed? Changing the market and making the position of farmers much stronger than it is today, vis-a-vis, -vis, um, for instance, supermarkets and, and traders in between. So that is one side. The other side is that you, you see uh, an, an ecological disaster due to the way that we produce uh, agricultural products at the moment in Europe. So we have to change it in a rather radical way, both financially and ecologically. Now, currently, food that is more ecological is more expensive to produce, more expensive to buy, and we know that in the future there's going to be less money in the European budget thanks to the United Kingdom leaving the EU. Does that necessarily mean less money will be available for farmers? No, not at all. In, in the model that I foresee for the future, um, farmers will make more money from the products that they produce. They get a, a much fairer price than they're getting now. And that means that we can save money that we now spend on direct income support and compensate farmers for additional work that they do for the environment, for landscape, etc., etc. Now we've been filming as well in Spain, which we know is the European leader in genetically modified crops. And they're currently banned here in the Netherlands. As we talk about innovation and look to the future, do you think that's something that could change? For me personally, I'm not against GMOs, but you have to do it carefully. I think there are much other ways by, by using um, a natural pest control, for instance. And those elements are now being, uh, being developed by high-tech firms. It's really high-tech. It is, it is not some old-fashioned uh, um, grandma stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it is really high-tech. And I think that is the future for agriculture, where we can still produce the amounts of food that we're producing now and maybe even more without the huge costs for the environment that we see now. Well, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. And for your thoughts, German Jan Gebrandi. Now we've been talking about plants here, but what about animals? Our reporter Luke Brown has been in Scotland looking into some very cutting edge research in the field of livestock gene editing. These little piggies herald a new era of healthy pork production. They're totally resistant to a serious disease, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, or PERS. So these piglets are definitely the future of eradicating PERS because they're resistant to the virus. They will never spread it. They will, they will never be affected by the disease. PERS is estimated to cost European pig farmers over a billion euros each year. Scientists at Edinburgh University's Roslyn Institute used a new gene editing technique called CRISPR to remove the pig's vulnerability to the disease at a genetic level. This contains DNA that we can then test in cells or generate ribonucleic acids from it that we can inject into zygotes for genome editing. This next generation of genetic modification is likened to using genetic scissors. Unlike transgenic GMOs, there's no genetic matter from another species. Gene editing is like accelerated crossbreeding, so it avoids the controversy that surrounds traditional GMOs. We don't want to play God, we just want to optimize something that is existent in nature. If we can, don't lose animals due to animal disease, we obviously gain much more animals at the end of the production chain, and the benefit is that these animals don't suffer through disease anymore. 30 kilometers from Roslyn lies a very different perspective. Pete Ritchie has been an organic farmer here for two decades. For him, the risks of dabbling in genes don't justify any potential gains in productivity. You know, we have so many important things to do to make food more accessible and available to people across the world that have a much higher impact than actually producing some new wonder plant that's going to crack it. Gene editing is only a recent innovation. For now, it falls under the EU's legislation restricting GMOs, but its champions are lobbying for an exemption. For organic farmers like Pete, the EU needs to err on the side of caution. I think it's been oversold that we can do this, it's perfect, and we can do exactly what we want to do, and there will be nothing will ever go wrong with this. I'm concerned that we open the door to deregulated, gene-edited plants coming into the food system and the ecosystem with unintended consequences. In 2015, Scotland banned all GMO use, going further than the rest of the UK. 
But Brexit could free the UK from EU norms in agriculture, potentially removing many GM regulations. Here at the Hutton Institute, the focus is on gene editing Scottish crops like potatoes and barley. The research here cannot be field tested, but the practical applications are being keenly watched. George Laurie is on the board at Hutton. He's also been a farmer all his life and wants to know the real world benefits of the research. What I'm asking for as a farmer, am I getting a more consistent, reliable product at the end? You'll get a better quality product mm. that will make better crisps if the experiment works. <laughs> Like many Scottish farmers, George was opposed to GMOs. But he sees gene editing as a vital aid for modern farmers to meet market demands. The gene editing is one of the new tools that's come into the toolbox. Within Europe, we've lost a lot of the ability to control disease through the loss of actives, uh, active chemicals. So we need to look at new ways that we can actually bring it, breed into uh, varieties better quality. And also, we need to be able to give uh, resistance to disease as well. The European Court of Justice is set to rule this year on the future of gene editing. But with researchers around the world already using the technique, it's impossible to prevent it from becoming more widespread. Well, it's here among some rather lovely Dutch flowers and a little Dutch rain that we'll say goodbye. Thanks very much for watching this show in the Netherlands and in Spain. We'll see you in summer for more agriculture news, more European news on France 24. You might watch France 24 in English, but don't forget, France 24 is also broadcast in French, Arabic, and Spanish. Available on cable and satellite systems and online media in France and around the world.